Hi. Last week we brought you an interview with the Wachowskis and Tom Tick for the directors of Cloud Atlas, one of the best movies of the entire year. Uh, the interview we brought you was about 10 or 11 minutes long, and it represented just about a third of the actual interview that I conducted. And uh, the response was incredible. People really liked the interview and wanted to see more. So I'm proud to give you right now the entire raw interview uh, with the Wachowskis and Tom Tickver, uh, and I hope that you enjoy it. Uh, so uh, grab a, a drink, settle back, and uh, prepare to enjoy me chatting for a half hour with some really talented directors. I'm Devin Faraci, this is Badass Digest. I'm at the Beverly Hilton with uh, Andy Wachowski, Lana Wachowski, and Tom Tick for the directors of Cloud Atlas, which uh, for my money, and this is where the butt kissing part of the thing begins, is like this is one- my favorite part. This is, this is the good When do we get to the butt kissing? Hurry. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is one of the most exciting and amazing movies of the year. I mean, this is like the decade's really young, but like it feels like one of those ones we're going to be looking back at at the end of the decade and going, wow, these guys really kick some ass on this one. And I think what I love about the movie is that it feels like you have, you're just running full speed into what this form can do as far as storytelling is concerned. And that's the most exciting thing about it for me in a lot of ways, which is that you've made a movie that is so complex and has so much going on, uh, but is still entertaining and still followable and still mainstream in, in that way. Uh, can you guys sort of talk about the, the approach that you had to sort of coming at this movie, which is so complicated and has so much going on uh, and, and, and making it work as well as you did? Obviously, it would have to start with the novel itself. The novel itself is full of um, um, forms and ideas and uh, narrative experiments and uh, love of genre and love of um, propulsive storytelling and uh, also a love for um, big ideas and philosophical investigations and uh, contexts that are that are bigger often than what we get out of genre right. literature, and uh, so that's uh, that was where the origin sort of began. It's really David Mitchell's original DNA kind of thing that we took and spliced our own DNA with and created. Frank and Baby. <laughs> well, it's so, you know, Frank and Baby is really interesting because, you know, Andy and Lana, you guys, you grew up writing and working together. There's, I'm assuming, almost like a twin talk thing mm -hmm. that happens when you get creative. Tom, you're coming into this, this knock sort of... Me. Knock, knock. <laughs> <laughs> it's like beneath the planet of the apes. You just have that thing. Uh, but it's, uh, Tom, you're coming into this. I mean, what is sort of that like to, to, to take the, the, the duo and make it a trio? Uh, I think the... The experience we had when we met the three of us. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just do the whole interview like this. It's just... <laughs> you can... <laughs> you know, that's a little naughty, but okay. Uh, the, the experience we had when we met first was, um, was this super excep exceptional, very unusual um, feeling of connectedness. I mean, in a, in a dimension that you don't, that you rarely have. I mean, anyhow, you don't meet directors much <laughs> in your life as a director. And if so, it's like on the hallway, in junkets maybe, or on a premiere, hello, and that's it. You don't really, it's, it's hard to, you know, even establish relationships because, you know, we're always working, and when we're not working, we're, you know, most of us ex escape. <laughs> so it's, it's not so easy. And <clears throat> we met, and had this kind of immediate bond, which had a lot to do with the fact that we we felt like we share a very similar uh, idea about uh, aesthetics and cinema, and our desire to uh, embrace cinema in its entirety, in all its facets, and 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 in all the genres that we embrace, and, and that that, it, that 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 you can you know explore in it. And that's why finding a book like Cloud Atlas was like an invitation for us. You know, it was rather, uh, it was not like, okay, we were on the lookout for something, but we, to, because we wanted this friendship to move on and because you can't meet much except if you work together. So we felt like that might be the solution, but finding something that really might be material for us seemed a bit like an idea, you know, a wishful thinking idea. But this book was like, oh, this is exactly, you know, it's, it seems like a literature, um, exp um, uh, how do you call it? 
incarnation of what binds us, what connects us. Well, it was funny the way it just kept resonating against our own lives, even the way that we kind of got together was resonant in the actual book. And we're, we're like the moment in the screenplay where Isaac Sachs opens the door and sees, you know, uh, Louisa there was Tom coming into the, to the, our editing suite where we were cutting Reloaded and Revolution. It was like this instant connection. We're like, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and we had this whole, um, you know, the idea that in the, the movie, it suggests that every person you meet has the potential to have a major impact on the direction of your life. And we had that when he came through the door. We were like, let's talk. Be together. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, just how does that work on a real functional level, just in terms of taking this big book and breaking it down and writing it? How does that, how, how, did the, how did the three of you work together to make that happen? Well, I mean, philosophically and ideologically, we're simpatico. It's like, you know, you know people say, oh, you know, the, me and Lana, we have twin speak, but it's not really the case. It's, you know, we're not... People who say that are real assholes, by the way. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's that the director's monologue is now a dialogue, and it's externalized, and people, you know, we, we come uh, towards filmmaking in a very uh, loving way, that uh, we're, uh, we're, we embrace the idea that it's a social art form, and uh, we think that it's wrong that directors take uh, possessory credits. It's, it's a discredit to the crews who work on the film. Um, and Tom is the exact same. And so, because uh, there is a dialogue going on between us in terms of what we think, how a scene should play out, it's easy for people, heads of department, actors, to plug into that sort of thing. And uh, you know, having a third who is uh, on the same wavelength as us, it was just a natural uh, extension. And so we all got together, and we, uh, uh, we weren't even sure that we would be able to plug in but, together, but uh, we went down to Costa Rica and uh, uh, started the experiment of could we write together. Um, which we think is a far more intimate process than anything you do in the uh, 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 making a movie. And, uh, you know, we started talking about what scenes were our favorites and what scenes were the sole reason to make the movie. <laughs> and uh, uh, 180 of them. <laughs> yes. And they all lined okay. up. We've got to cut something. <laughs> I'm interested in the, how that evolution happens from the script to the finished film because in Mitchell's book, it's this nesting format where you know it's the first half of each story and then it goes on and then it comes back around and recursively goes back to the beginning. You don't do that. It's a constant back and forth. And you know, I've only seen the movie once, so but in the time that I watched it, it was exciting to sort of watch how uh, it, it transitioned back and forth. It would transition based on movement. It would transition based on thematics. It would transition based on emotion. That to me feels like something that obviously you had to discover in the editing room. I mean, that is, is that, is that how that worked? It, it was always, um, well, I mean, at first it starts with the fragmenting of the structure and, and this mosaic form instead of this more almost, um, you know, we call it, pa it's a palindrome or it's a pyramid, this, this, uh, uh, it's musical, both forms are musical, but one is a little bit more, um, um, these larger structural pieces, and one has this very fast, fluid um, um, structure. You know, and that the was palindrome how... is thematic. You know, it's like it's about eternal recurrence, which is a theme of the book. And so, like structurally, uh, uh, so long as we, we felt, so long as we got uh, ideas of eternal recurrence happening within the mosaic that it almost, the structure didn't matter. Right? You knew and, that reading the book that there were lots of things that related to a larger ish, a, a larger concept. And when you put the book down, you don't think that you read six short stories. You think, you feel, you begin to experience a single novel. The, it works on your brain in a way that suggests that it's it's not six disparate pieces, but even the structure is reinforcing this idea that it's interconnected. So what we thought was, well, the effect the book has on you is the the movie that we wanted to make. 
we just said like what happens to your brain after you read the book was exciting to us that that part of your brain that starts weaving it all together and seeing it as a whole we said well my head sees it as a whole so there must be a way in to find that version of the movie that's where we started yeah it's interesting because <clears throat> we've been talking recently we've been asked so often about the the compositional element of it you know the whole idea that it is that it has a musical feel to it the way it's even organized the movie and i was really thinking about that actually last night that there is a you could say there is a relationship that you can um you know if, as as if um uh, mitchell david was creating something that is more much more clearly identifying notes you know in its relationship to each other like you know like if, if, as if it was a melody that has a very clear structure like a bach sonata or something and i think what we did was much more like an orchestral approach with chords you know i mean as opposed to single notes you know or we were trying to create a chord like structure in it which i think is of course still not exactly what it is but it has to do with this idea that to pick up on the idea of how it happened was that <coughs> you know to take the book by individual moments that we felt like were valuable and put them on an index card and then spread them across the floor and have like rooms full of cards and us three walking amongst those cards and realizing the more we brought them out of you know the order that they had in the book the more there was a different and a separate system within connected within those stories where you could actually put this card next to this card and maybe lose that one for this because that connection uh, uh, you know made the third one not irrelevant in a way you know because some stories were telling situations that we did not have to repeat then later <coughs> and uh, and that's what also made us discover that there was an inherent logic to the system that uh, david had created that that worked on you after you read the novel but that should work on you while you were watching the movie already in the middle of it It, watching the movie, you're discovering it as you go along. It's really exciting. It's, it's, it's a real process of being involved in, in the movie in a way that I think a lot of films aren't. But you're trusting the audience in a big way, or you believe in the audience to be able to follow. I mean, I, is that sort of your, your general philosophy about filmmaking, is that you trust the modern audience to be able to follow along with this? What? That's a leading question, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> Ow. Look, I, I think people go to movies like you go to movies and we go to movies that they want to not simply be passive consumers and they are they are stimulated by a broader range of material than just um, entertainment that they want to be engaged i think there's lots of audience members out there i mean our career is basically built by people who want to be engaged, his career for certain, that, that are seeking out a more, um, a more challenging material that asks you to uh, be present with what's in, and engage in, in the ideas. And, um, you know, I, I, I figure that it, as soon as that audience stops going to the movies, then our careers will be over. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because in, uh, in a lot of ways, I look at Speed Racer as a film that sort of is uh, making a lot of statements about how you guys feel about the art form, it almost feels like. And one of them is, I'm going to just paraphrase it, Trixie says, you know, since when is winning important? And Speed says, winning is important because I like, I like driving, and to keep driving, I have to keep winning. And it's sort of, that feels like, the, the, this film feels like that kind of a thing where you want to work on a big canvas. And so it's important to be able to get out to a larger audience. You're sort of, you know, Tom, you're, you're, a lot of your films are smaller. And so you're able to sort of go and do things that are a little bit more personal with this, the level of this thing where it gets this big and it costs, even for an independent film, it's a, it's, 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 it's a big thing. You have to balance those two things. I mean, the winning does end up being part of the, the, the game if you want to keep racing. Well, we just, I think we really share this belief that there is uh, actually the amount of people out there waiting for this kind of stuff is huge and they just get fed. They're so horribly underfed, you know, they're like, there's a hunger <laughs> for more of this, which, uh, which isn't satisfied. And that's why also many, many <clears throat> adult audiences, and I mean that word in the broadest sense, you know, because adult means, I think there's many 16 year olds already who really crave for intelligent, 
writing and uh, you know I mean stuff that they can discuss about and you know or you know send a lot of emails and if you <coughs> if you see the the movement that that has happened in the last decade towards television and how many people are actually decided have decided to spend much more time watching movies on television because of the series is the culture that has evolved uh, that has a lot to do with the fact that that those this is now the home of adult uh, film entertainment with intelligent writing and uh, we feel like that's amazing because we watch it too but it has of course the downside that where are the films that still you know deliver this kind of uh, you know complexity and yet fill a large screen and a big I mean a large canvas compositions in visual and in aesthetic terms and they're rare and uh, we think the, the moment the audience realizes there is more of this they will really become they will all come back right. watch movies on in cinemas I mean they do occasionally we have some movies once in a while where we see see it right. happens yeah, there's something too about television, which which relates also to what you were asking before about structure, which I didn't know if you wanted to keep exploring. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, it yeah, is an important yeah. to us. Structure is a big issue for us in storytelling terms, and you can see that there is a, a serial aspect to television series that you could use as a template for understanding Cloud Atlas's right. structure. When you start, when we started breaking it down, we're like, well, you know, I mean, people are watching Lost, and they're watching something as you know, structurally complex as, say, uh, The Wire or uh, uh, Six Feet Under. These are, these are sort of propulsive narratives that are quite complex and fragmented and tell stories through um, multi-branched structures. And when we started laying it out, that was a, a, a broad um, template that we're using to say, like, oh, yeah, I think audiences are are familiar with this kind of complex structure enough that they'll be able to. Now on the other side of that, we, we are also, yes, always searching to push it farther. It wasn't enough that we <laughs> took this very, but we now we had to make it different genres. That was exciting, no one's ever done that. And most importantly, no one has ever combined tone in the way that we did in this film. That was probably one of the most radical, and then of course, that wasn't far enough for us either. So then we had to have all of the actors playing all of the parts, right. and then we're like, okay, this is getting there. <laughs> well, tone, that's, a, you know, tone that, that's the minefield, is that tone, because audiences can be very, it can be very, you can lose an audience very quickly by transitioning your tone improperly, uh, and what, bec what was something that was momentous becomes silly all of a sudden as a result of not handling that tone right. I think you guys nailed it. Can you sort of talk about the philosophy of how to approach tone in something as complex as this? Well, this was, I guess, where editing came in really profoundly, you know? I guess that's why we had to also sometimes go, oh, 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 oh. We were, that, that was a second research phase. Yeah, uh, it started uh, in the script, obviously, and uh, uh, the script was uh, much more aggressive in terms of uh, cutting from one story to the next. Uh, and, you know, finding connections maybe in a line of dialogue um, that worked on the page but uh, didn't necessarily work uh, on screen. And there would be these moments where, you know, it would just be like asses and bases and, you know, it would blow up in our face. The first, uh, the first screening we were, uh, not only was it that there was a tonal problem, but also rhythmically it, it came out uh, too hard and uh, too fast. And, you know, we were, you know, okay, that didn't work. <laughs> Back to the drawing board. And so, the, you know, rhythmically we began to uh, uh, ease up a little bit in the beginning, give uh, people a chance to catch their breath after the preamble. And then also finding uh, moments where, you know, maybe it wasn't such a good idea to cut from, you know, a Cavendish slapstick moment to, uh, you know, the Kona eating people. <laughs> so. But you had the advantage, of course, because of the, the idea of actors playing multiple characters to then say, okay, but maybe we can cut from... Um, 
Cavendish to heirs to the character, to the composer in the 30s, because it is the same actor, even though it's tonally different, but because it's the same personality somehow in behind there, you slip in more easily, even though you have to make a, quite a shift, you know, getting back in there. But sometimes what even everybody on screen were the yeah. same people. Yeah. <laughs> Every like two or three actors were the same actors in a different story with different characters. And even though the jump was huge, but because you felt like, oh, well, but it's sort of, we're still with them. Right. That was easing, you know, the juxtaposing sense of it. Right, that particularly worked well when in the end uh, uh, where we're interweaving uh, the Cavendish story with the Louisa Ray story and you're going from Noakes mm -hmm. to Bill Smoke. Yeah. And so yeah. that the, the two it's villains can, you know, yeah. It comes through the door. Yeah. Like, the villain still, it's almost like Halloween, like Jason, he's like still alive. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. you smack him down and then he's back up. Right. And that's like actually one of our favorite conclusions in that area because it's um, uh, uh, Jim Sturgis as the Highlander smashing Nurse Noakes over the head and his uh, soul-bound love is Duna Bay who is bashing Bill Smoke over the head. Yeah. Uh, as the Mexican woman, and then at the very end, they're confronted by their father and father-in-law in a Haskell Moore. Right. Well, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. There was just uh, I was just gonna say the whole way that the transitions worked. Where, where it was a constant kind of. Uh, source of joy and delight like we would work things out on the page and we would be so excited you know I mean it started with the cards when you were looking at the cards and you said oh that would be an amazing transition and we had this transition from the very beginning of on the cards of like um, the flood hitting um, Chang and Somni and then Louisa waking up underwater and then her <laughs> breaking out of the car and floating up and Zachary saying nay the dead never stay dead and then you see the torch and then it goes past Holly's yeah, face and it was the same actor right. and um, so that was in the card form we had that transition we're like oh this is gonna be so great and then so we had things that we wrote and we developed as a as, as kind of a um, in, on the page in the terms of the transition, but then there were ones that we discovered while we were prepping and we would we would think of a camera move or we would think of a transition like the, the dissolve, that beautiful dissolve that has um, um, Frobisher searching for the book and then turning in the bed and there's Six Smith that came up sort of in the in the in the prep work. And then there was like during the editing we discovered all new sort of transitions. So I love that you're saying that it, it flows so smoothly because it was um, it was one of our sources of pleasure, our real source of pleasure, and making it uh, almost sculpting it in this kind of way, and constantly finding new beautiful ways to dissolve the borders between not only these genres and time periods and characters, but in the audience's mind that we started with these six disparate things. And you think, this is six totally separate things that don't have anything to do with each other. How are you going to... And then slowly weave, 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 it's, until it's, it's, the end you are completely in one story. It's a, it's a different use of editing. I mean, it's amazing to watch how that happens and how you do that. Um, I, I have to wrap this up, but I have a question I really what? want to ask. I know. Um, Get out of there. Is we'll that, just uh, stay here. <laughs> is that I walked out of this movie and I said to myself, this is the ultimate atheist movie. Because what it says is that the things that you do, there it may not be an eternal life or, an, or hereafter, but the things that I do today will echo forever and the way that I treat people. But on the other hand, people have also looked at it as these recurring characters. It's a reincarnation. It's a, it's a continuing, soul, as you said, soul-bound thing. Uh, I'm just curious you know, if you guys could talk about sort of the, the philosophical concepts behind that. Is, am I totally wrong in seeing this as a, almost an atheist manifesto that what, what we do now matters forever? I think we do like <clears throat> that it has an openness to, you know, to an audience's perception that you can read it, I think, in uh, quite, you know, not like too many variations, but that there is a way that you can bring yourself and your perception of world and of and your spiritual relationship to world, whatever it is and how intense ever it is, uh, can find a place in the movie without being excluded. You know, it's not excluded, exclusive much towards uh, a certain amount of. <clears throat> um, transcendental perspective but I think I always loved the idea that I could for myself always say for instance to an actor you know you're playing uh, a genetic string 
that's the joy of your, you know, of this uh, of this invitation. And then still, some of the actors would say like, yeah, but I, I'd rather stay with the idea of a soul, you know, of a soul, and you know, the whole reincarnation subject. And we feel like uh, it's it, it's all it it all works within the system. It's not it's not dogmatic. It's not it's not an ideological movie. Yeah, for sure. We want. I mean, the book the book stimulates you in ways that are both secular and spiritual. The book offers you this um, invitation to think about uh, things like immortal love and a a. Um, uh, a life beyond your life and a connectivity beyond your uh, materiality, which is very romantic and that sort of, you know, can touch a part of me that is romantic. But there is also a part of the book that is appeals very much to my more Epicurean, let's say, not atheist, I prefer Epicurean, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, understanding of the world that Jose Saramago suggested in the in his great work Blindness. He had a line in there that was sort of paraphrased in Somni's thing where he said, the consequences, uh, the nature of our immortal lives or in the consequences of our words and deeds that go on apportioning themselves throughout all time. I love this idea that your choices, no matter who you are, you work in a McDonald's, you are a general, you're a president, no matter what level you're at, Every action, every choice, every consequence ripples out from you and has an impact on our future world. Um, this is a, a more secular understanding of immortality that I find incredibly compelling. And the fact that the book, like the movie, offers you a way to think about both and um, um, participate in a, an understanding of the world through both of those perspectives, I think is one of the things that brings the richness to the book and the film. Yeah, why can't it be both? I mean, in the same way that we say, why can't we have all these genres coexisting in one movie? Why can't you, know? you have three directors? Why can't you have three directors? <laughs> why can't actors play multiple parts? <laughs> so. well, guys, thank you so much. Uh, I have to wrap up now. I want to uh, this movie to me, I mean, this is back. We're back to the butt kissing now. It's such an incredible, beautiful, and I thought we'd movie. never get back to the butt kissing. Uh, <laughs> Thank and, God. And to me, again, I have to go back to Speed Racer one more time. This movie says to me, says I think to everything else, get this weak shit off my track because it is you are barreling. I love ahead. that you keep quoting Speed Racer. <laughs> and, and to tell you a very honest insight, that that Speed Racer was um, Andy and I were also processing a lot of. Uh, what's difficult about working in this business. And so a lot of the relationship that Speed has with Royalton is something that was very personal and going on in our lives. And, and then, you know, at the same time we've talked about it, we wanted to make something that was aesthetically challenging to audiences, something like a, a Cubist film. And we're like, could you make a Cubist film? And even that, you know, we were like, oh, you know, you, you're not allowed to do these sorts of things. And Cloud Atlas continues to be a way that we keep trying to do things that people say, you're not allowed to do that. I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys are not allowed to do next. So yeah. that's, that's going to be pretty exciting. So thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I'm Devin Faraci. This is Badass Digest. And I'll see you again next week. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. It's such an honor and a pleasure. Thank you oh, so much. Thank you. Thanks, man. Really we should have an in-depth conversation oh, on Speed Racer. I, I, I could go on for an hour and a half about Speed Racer. The best horror movies of the new millennium provided an array of inspired terror, torture, and gore. Frankenstein's monster has bolts. That's it. Like, that's, there's no other way to do it. And then you realize just how out there it all was. You know, it was quite extreme.